Hello, everyone. I'm Antonio, uh, one of the Epsilon developers, together with Dimitris and many other people in the ASC group. And this talk is about some new capabilities that um, I've added to Epsilon from 2.6 for remote debugging. And um, particularly, this has been done through the Microsoft Debug Adapter Protocol. Um, so some of these talk, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what is the debug adapter protocol, why you should care, why, you know, how it might be useful to you besides Epsilon, because you, know, you might not necessarily be uh, completely interested in, in Epsilon, but you might want at some point to develop some kind of debugging tool for some language that you may have um, yourself. Epsilon, just in case there's anybody who's unfamiliar with what Epsilon is, it's a family of scripting languages and tools for model management. So that covers query models, validating them, transforming them, and so on. And it's not just the MF models. It could also be XML files, CSV files, JSON, YAML, and many other different model types. So one thing that is nice about Epsilon is that you can run it in many different ways. You can uh, run it from an Eclipse launch configuration from the Eclipse ID. You can embed an Epsilon script inside an Eclipse plugin. You can embed it inside the Java program. You can run it from Ant as well. And that Ant task could be used from Gradle as well. So there's many different ways to run these Epsilon programs. But in terms of ways to debug Epsilon programs, until um, Epsilon 2.5 and including Epsilon 2.5. Um, you would only be able to do that from Eclipse ID debug configurations. So if you wanted to debug some Epsilon program that was five layers deep into some rich client platform program, you would be out of luck. You have to find some way to run it from a normal debug configuration in Eclipse and somehow preserve whatever environment you were preparing for that Epsilon um, script. We had a few demands from different people in industry saying, oh, we've embedded Epsilon in you know, this particular solution. and we seeing a problem in a script and we would like to debug it? What do we do? So in Epsilon 2.6 and later, you can actually do this. You can debug Epsilon programs from whatever you are running them using what's called the Microsoft Debug Adapter Protocol. And this talk is a little bit about how we did it and how you can use it. So let's talk a little bit about the Debug Adapter Protocol first, just in case, because I, th I think it's interesting. I think it's, you know, it's useful to under understand what we're doing really here. The problem that the Microsoft Debug Adapter Protocol, or just DAP from now on, is trying to solve is the fact that Say that you are the developer of, particular, of a particular programming language and you want IDEs to be able to debug programs written in your language. The traditional approach is you create your own little debugging tooling for your different development tools. So in your IDE, you have a debugger. In your you know, editor, like Emacs or Veeam, you have some kind of debugger extension. In whatever other tool, you end up with some debugger extension. And all of these are written from scratch, and they're all weird and wonderful and different and unique in their own way. This is a lot of unnecessary development effort where you could just have the one implementation of debugging for your programming language. And that's sort of the point of DAP. So the idea is in your development tools, you would just have a generic debugger that understands the DAP protocol. And then you would have one debug adapter that would expose the debugging facilities of your language through that protocol. So you would have one Node debug adapter, one Python debug adapter, one C-sharp debug adapter, and then any DAP client that meets the spec can just debug programs written in that language. So the way in which DAP works, it's, it's essentially a website. Um, it has a spec that mandates a minimum set of interactions for the client and the server. So the client is your IDE, say Eclipse or VS Code, and the server is the adapter. So it's the actual debugger 
essentially of your programming language. The client and server can also declare additional optional capabilities. So you can say, oh, um, I understand variable types, you know, for debug variables, for instance, right? Or I support the terminate request. I can actually, you know, honor the request for terminating the execution of the program and so on. All the messages are JSON based. They're just very simple JSON messages. And actually DAP is transport agnostic. One way to do DAP is over just the standard input and standard output streams of the adapter, essentially. And another way is over a TCP connection, for instance. There's a certain sequences of um, messages that the spec mandates. So two that are interesting are about starting a DAP session. And the other one is about, you know, what happens when you actually stop at the breakpoint. To start a, a DAP session, there's actually different ways to do this, but usually what you do first is the development tool will have some way of starting the debug adapter. That debug adapter will sort of open a connection. You have, you establish a connection between the development tool and the debug adapter. And there's an initialized request from the development tool to the debug adapter saying, hello, I'm VS Code. I can do these things. What about you? And the debug adapter will reply back saying, I'm the debug adapter. I can also, I can do these things in response. And then based on that, the development tool will sort of reconfigure itself. Then the development tool will send whatever breakpoints you might have, and then say, I'm done telling you about breakpoints. Please start the execution. And execution will then start in the background, and we might be getting some events about the execution as it goes on. In When you actually stop at a breakpoint, so in this case, this example is for a C program. So somebody set a breakpoint and the actual C, the real C debugger, so GDB in the case of, you know, the GNU tools, stopped the execution at some point, told the debug adapter about it. And the debug adapter tells the IDE, hey, um, execution has stopped here. And then the development tool says, oh, okay, that's fine. Tell me about what are the currently running threads. Tell me about the stack trace of each of those threads. Tell me about the variable scopes within a given stack trace um, element. Tell me about the variables that are available within a certain scope. Um, so what are the actual variables that people can, can see? And you know, they can get quite complicated, but essentially this is what you do, right? You can get all the information that you need about what is the current state of the program. And then at some point you might get some, the user may press some button saying, I want to continue execution, or I want to step over or step in or step out, and then continue will proceed. And you might get more events about things stopping at certain places and so on. But eventually the program will exit and the debug adapter will tell the IDE, hey, execution completed, the debugging session is done. This is essentially how the debug adapter protocol works. There are already quite a few implementations of this protocol. So in terms of clients, VS Code is pretty much the reference uh, implementation of DAP, but also for Eclipse, there's Eclipse LSP4E, so literally language server protocol for Eclipse. LSP4E covers both the clients for the actual language server protocol. So that is more for editing and the debug adapter protocol, which is for debugging. Then in terms of servers, so these are the debug adapters. There are quite a few. And in the slide, I have more links uh, to servers, adapters for other languages. But say, you know, there's some for C++, there are some for Java, and there are many for the, you know other different programming languages as well. Then you have what are called SDKs. Uh, which are essentially development kits. And these allow you to implement your own debug adapter using a given language. If you want to write your debug adapter using Node, there's a link there to one library that you can use from Microsoft to do that. If you want to implement your debug adapter using Java, Eclipse has a project for this called LSP4J. And so LSP4E is the client. LSP4J is the development kit to create your own debug adapters. And now let's talk about Epsilon in particular and how we've done this. The way in which we've uh, implemented support for the debug adapter protocol in Epsilon is we've used LSP4J to implement the server side, so the actual debug adapter. We've used LSP4E as is without actually making any source changes. 
for the Eclipse base client, and I will demo that in a bit. And we've also added the ability to debug from the Epsilon VS Code extension. So if you want to just run and debug Epsilon code, you don't need Eclipse anymore. You can just use VS Code if you want it. And I will also show a, a demo about it in a bit. The way in which DAB works in Epsilon is there's actually two options to essentially run programs using DAB. There are two endpoints essentially to the protocol. One is a launch endpoint where you send some kind of configuration and the adapter is supposed to, to set up and launch the program for you. And attach, which is where the program is already running and the adapter just attaches to it. So the way in which we've done it for Epsilon is we actually only support attaching to a pre-configured script. Whatever you're doing, you already have some code that sets up your Epsilon program. So you know you have some code that will say these are the models you're using, this is how you're setting up everything, and so on. The only thing that we do is we take that pre-configured script and we hand it over to the debug adapter uh, for it to attach to that program, essentially. And this was done for design reasons. We didn't want the adapter to have to know about all the current and future Epsilon languages because we thought that would be you know, really bad for maintenance later on. And I'll, I'll show what it looks like in a bit in the demo. Now it's time for the demos. I have four prepared today. Uh, so two about Epsilon, debugging Epsilon programs embedded in a Java program. One about debugging Epsilon when running from Ant another uh, debugging Epsilon running from Gradle in VS Code. So let's get started with the Epsilon embedded in Java. I've got here an Eclipse uh, installation. All these examples are part of the Eclipse Epsilon repository. If you go to the Eclipse Epsilon uh, GitHub project and you go to examples and you scroll down, to examples.eol.dab. So this one, you'll find this same example that I'm going to be demoing now, just in case. And I dropped the link um, in the chat as well. Here the, in this example project, I've got a few Epsilon scripts. And you know, there's a bunch of different, there's a readme in case you want to just carefully read through these and understand all the examples and so on. And there's also a, a few launch configurations as well that you can try running yourself. But for the purposes of this presentation, I'll just start with a more simple example. Say that we have this hello program and I kept it as simple as possible. So it's not using any models, actually. This is just to, to show you the debugging. So I have a little something here. I have an operation that says produce greeting and it's just going to return a string saying hello and the full name of whoever I'm mentioning. So I have two lines that print that and then I have something that prints a small collection, something that prints a larger collection with a thousand elements and that's pretty much it. Suppose I wanted to debug this program, but I'm not running it from Eclipse. I am running it from this little Java program. This is an example of the most minimal use of Epsilon to um, run it from a Java program. So I create an EOL module, I parse the module. I may have done quite a bit of other setup. I may have set it up with models and so on, but eventually what you would want is you would want to execute it. So normally what you would do is you would just do module.execute and this would run the module normally. If you want to instead debug the program, what you do is you replace that module executes with these two lines of code. What you do is you wrap the module in an Epsilon debug server object. You specify on which port you want the debug server to listen, and then you say run. So if you run this program, you'll see that you get this little string saying, uh, I started the Epsilon debug server, and you'll notice that nothing is happening, and this is because the debug server is waiting for connections. So now what I will do is I will use the Eclipse LSP4E client to start a debugging session and connect to this Epsilon debug server. So LSP4E was something that already existed. I've just basically installed it into this Eclipse, and that's pretty much it. And I have a debug configuration here, which is from LSP4E. So it's particularly this one. 
And if you notice, the only thing I'm saying is connect to a running debug server, um, running on localhost, port 4040, just not attach. But I'm not saying anything else because I'm just attaching to an already existing um, Epsilon program. So I connect to that. This has uh, stopped at the first breakpoint that I had, right? So it's right here. And you'll see here that I've got the different threads. So Epsilon only has the one thread and I'm in the global scope. And if I go here to variables, you'll see this one scope, which is unprotected. And I've got the default variables that you get from Epsilon, you know, no and system. These are predefined variables. And then I have the values for the different, you know, variables about that um, managing here. So in the case of say a small collection, you can just see the different elements. And the interesting thing about the way this is built is, you know, you can have arbitrary nested and complex variables and everything, and you could just keep expanding and expanding to see whatever you're interested in. And if it's a large collection, what we actually do, which is similar to what you see in say Java, is we slice the collection into, I think right now it's 100 element chunks, so that we're not trying to send too much at once. So in this case, we say, okay, you have a thousand elements, and here's the first slice of 100 elements, and you can go through that and just fine. We've got some code for things like uh, model element properties as well. So if something is a model element property, you will see it in here and you will be able to expand it and see the different properties of the model element and so on. So we have some code for that as well. From then on, I can continue execution and this works just fine. Say that your program was not just some file from the file system that you were running, but you actually were packaging the Epsilon script as part of your program. That you actually included that Epsilon script in your class path, right? As part of a, of a Java file. In that case, and I can show you an example, say for instance that your Epsilon script was actually in the Java program itself. And so it was one resource that you included in the Java file. Now, if you have it like this, you're not going to be loading it as just a normal file, you're going to be loading it from the class path using a URI. So it's going to be a bit more complicated and I will show you what it looks like. In the case that you're loading the script from a URI, right? So in this case, you notice that we're not loading it from a file, we're loading it from a URI and the URI comes from the class path because you've packaged your Epsilon script in your Java file. So if you do that, the debug adapter in principle doesn't know how to translate this URI to an actual file to show on your IDE. So what you have to do is you have to register a uh, mapping from URIs to paths in your file system. And what we're doing here is we're saying, well, that particular URI, it translates to this source file so that when you hit a breakpoint, the appropriate mappings um, are done and debugging works as it should be. It's mentioned in documentation, it, you can, not only do individual URIs, you can also do a prefix. So you can say this particular URI prefix translates to this particular folder in my system. And that way with one mapping, you can deal with a whole tree of Epsilon files if you needed to. So I'm just gonna show how it works. I uh, just have this launch configuration. Well, I've set this breakpoint here on the first line, and I will just run this little bit here. And if I run that, you see that it's literally the same thing. I just started the Epsilon debug server. I do my debug configuration. I stop right here and I can control execution as usual, right? I can step in, step over, and I can see the variables that I've got here, right? So I've got first name, argument, last name, argument, full name, uh, value here. And I can also go through the different scopes here as well. So I can continue execution and I'm done. So that's the case where you're trying to debug something that is in the class path and not necessarily just a normal file in your file system. Another example that I want to show is what happens if you're trying to debug an Epsilon program, which is running from an AND uh, workflow as well. This example comes with a build.xml that shows you how this would work. There are two new attributes 
that you would put when you're trying to call some Epsilon script. Here, we're trying to run this hello.dol script. And what we do is we say uh, debug is true and debug port is 4040. And if you do that, then you will use that. So if you're running your workflow from Eclipse, if you don't specify the debug port, you will fall back to the traditional way that we do debugging, which is directly through Eclipse APIs. If you are specifying these attributes, you will start the DAP server on port 4040, and you will use the, the new approach based on that. And if you're running Ant from outside of Eclipse, you will need to use this DAP based approach because essentially, you know, there's no Eclipse alternative in that scenario. So if I just run this example, launch configuration, this time I'm running the Ant workflow and you see that it essentially stops here because it's waiting for somebody to connect in this case. So I will do that. And it's otherwise it's literally the same, right? There's no, there's no difference really in how it works. It's literally the same debugger, literally the same logic, literally the same client. It's just we're running it through Ant in this case. And I think I've got another example here for inspecting objects as well. So I might as well do that. I've got here a little example where I have a very small person uh, meta model and I have some people in here too. So I've got, I will just make sure I register that package just in case. So I got this very minimal uh, person model with two people. I have John and I have Jane, I think John Doe and Jane Smith, something like that. And suppose that they wanted to debug that. So the way it would look is I create my module, I parse, I set up my models in whatever way I usually do. And then I just hand this over to the Epsilon debug server. So I will run this example using the launch configuration. You'll see that it has the usual message that I have to wait for. And now I can debug Epsilon on that port. And I had a breakpoint already set on the second line of this example. So I find the person whose first name is Jane, and then I print out the last name. And what you can see here is I've got Jane here, and I can inspect uh, the properties. And there's also the list of friends, and their friend only has one friend, who is John Doe, who has no friends. So as I said, you can continue exp expanding all these different properties and following reference references and so on. And this uses the same EMC APIs. So you will be able to see the properties of, say, an XML element or a JSON element and so on, so long as they meet the reflective model APIs that we have in the Epsilon model connectivity layer. Let's say that you're not using Eclipse at all, uh, you're using VS Code instead. This also works. There is an extension, as I said before, for Epsilon. So it's this one, Eclipse Epsilon Languages uh, from Sam Harris from Codebox in Australia. And in the version 2.2, they've added debugging support so long as you're using Epsilon 2.6, because it depends on this new support for the debug adapter protocol. And the way it works is very similar to the way it works in, uh, say, with Ant on Eclipse. The way you run Epsilon programs from VS Code is you use essentially Gradle, uh, the Gradle support. And what you do is you bring in through Gradle dependencies, you bring in the Ant tasks. So in this case, we've brought in the 2.6 and tasks and also the EMF and tasks as well. There's a little bit of setup for task devs in Ant and so on that you have to do. And then you will have some Ant tasks. You would use the Ant task to run the program. So in this case, we have a run hello task that depends on this Epsilon setup. And you will run this EOL script and you will pass the uh, debug flag and the port. One nice thing that you can do with Gradle, which is a bit you know, more flexible than, say, just pure AND, is I've got these variables here, and I give them initial values of 40, 40, and actually false. So if you just run run hello, that will not stop the program from debugging. That will just run the script normally. But if you were to run debug hello, that will turn on debugging, and then you would stop 
this script at the start and wait for a connection before you continue executing. Got a few examples of this as well. There's the other bits uh, in terms of you know how you set this up and so on, but it's still the same basic approach. I've got here a launch configuration that allows me to try out these different examples. You see that I've got here the inspect object, uh, same, exactly the same epsilon script as we did in Eclipse just now. And I can run this. I can run this launch configuration and that will run Gradle. It will run that specific task in Gradle. It will wait for the debug server to start. And once it started, it will connect to it. And you will be able to just inspect things in exactly the same way. Because the good thing about this is we're using literally the same backend code to inspect variables and check threads and everything, whatever we do. And the good thing is, you know, if somebody wanted to create a debugger for, I don't know, NeoVim, for instance, it would just be a matter of finding out how do you configure NeoVim to connect to the Epsilon dub server. They wouldn't need to do anything to Epsilon itself. And you know, I'm able to control execution just the same as I did in Eclipse as well. Now, the way this works is just so you see what the launch configurations look like. It's a little bit involved to set up at first, but one, you know, this is documented in the in the Epsilon website. It's not that complicated once you do it the first time. What we do is say that I want to debug a, you know, this. Zero one hello program, right? So I want to debug this and I want to set my breakpoints and so on. What I do in my launch uh, configurations file, I say, well, I have an attach uh, configuration of type epsilon with this name connecting to this port. Now, if you didn't specify this, the only thing it would do is it would try to connect to an epsilon script that was waiting for connections on that port. That's it. It wouldn't actually start the epsilon script. But with this pre-launch task, we can tell it to first run the uh, debug hello task in Gradle. So it will first run this. It will wait until the server has come up and then it will try to connect to it. And the way you declare this epsilon debug hello task is there's another bit, uh, there's another file called tasks.json way you declare this, right? So you say, well, epsilon debug hello refers to this particular task. Uh, this is something that you know was already implemented by the Gradle support in um, VS Code. This is not something that we did ourselves. So this is a Gradle task where you run this particular Gradle task. And uh, from this specific Gradle file that is in this workspace folder and this project folder, you have to specify the info flag, and this is documented in the Epsilon website, because um, this is how we get the little message that the server has started. So this is how we know that the server is ready for connections. You also need to include this Epsilon debug problem matcher as well. Again, this is also documented on the website. This is the bit that will watch out for the actual message saying server has started. And you also need to specify is background true, essentially telling VS Code, this is a background process. Don't wait for it to complete. Wait until you see the server has started and then you start debugging. Okay, so all of these little details are documented in the Epsilon website. But once you do this, the good thing is you only have to do this once. And from then on, if you want to debug your program, you just click on this one thing and it will do everything for you. It's not like in Eclipse where you have to separately start the Epsilon server, and then use LSP 4 e to connect. And this is it in terms of a demo. I will just switch for the last few of my slides. So in general, the summary is from Epsilon 2.6, we have DAP support. And wherever you're running your Epsilon programs, you can debug them. It doesn't matter if it's you know, Eclipse and Gradle, whatever, we can connect to it, we can debug it. And the detailed documentation is on the Epsilon website in case you want to check. We have a pretty long article here kind of explaining how everything works, how you use it and, and so on.